as Louise says, good evening, everybody. Uh, again, it's my pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the second lecture in the Assembly Commission series of four lectures marking this particular significant year of centenaries in 2021. Those of you who have joined us a fortnight ago for the launch of this series will be aware that the eminent historian and good friend of the Assembly, Dr. Raymond Phoenix, has agreed to present all four lectures. For those joining us tonight for the first time, the Perspectives on series is an important initiative through which the Assembly Commission has agreed to mark key centenaries over the last decade. And in doing so, we have been clear about acknowledging and respecting all of the different views and perspectives that there are on these events. Therefore, for this year's significant centenaries, the Commission agreed that it was again appropriate to have a series of lectures in which Eamon could explore the events of 1921 in detail. I think it is very positive that the Commission is facilitating, facilitating this opportunity for discussion on critical events from our shared history. Tonight's lecture is the first of two looking at these issues from different political perspectives. Tonight's lecture centres on the Unionist and the Loyalist perspective and obviously focuses on Unionist leaders at the time. I have no doubt that Eamon will guide us on this process with his usual blend of insight, enthusiasm and passion for the subject in hand. At the end of the lecture, there will be some time, maybe 15, 20 minutes or so, hopefully to open up the floor for a short period of questions and comments. So during the lecture, please feel free to enter any questions you have in the chat box, and we'll take a note and try to cover some of those at least. So without any further delay, can I now invite Damon to commence tonight's lecture? Dr. Raymond Phoenix. Much indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A pleasure to be back speaking to you this evening and looking at the kind of unionist loyalist leadership of unionism in these years, which result, of course, in the partition of Ireland and the creation of a new entity called Northern Ireland, exactly a hundred years ago, really, as we as we speak. So uh, I want to uh, rely on my uh, colleague Louise this evening to flag up some slides as we're going along. So perhaps, Louise, you could show us the first slide. And of course, we're looking at Craig Carson, unionism and the creation of Northern Ireland. And just moving on to the next slide, please, just to give us a sense of this period. And I mean, we have to go back really in terms of understanding the events of the uh, 1918 to 22 period to the end of the 19th century. Remember, British politics were polarized between the new Liberal Party, now in power by 1886, and led by Mr. William Gladstone, the, uh, the Liberal Prime Minister. Um, and of course, on the other side, usually the government in these years, um, you had the Conservative Party. And of course, Ireland became the touchstone of British politics in this period, really 1885 to 1925, you might as well say, until the border was finally confirmed. And much of the focus is on the grand old man, Gladstone himself, because it was his conversion as a former unionist, a former, you know, very conservative man, his conversion to the idea of home rule for Ireland, self-government for Ireland within the United Kingdom, that actually transformed the political scene. His first home rule bill tabled in 1886 failed. His second, it was um, split his own party, it didn't get through the House of Commons. His second bill in 1893 was defeated by the House of Lords, which for another 25 years had an absolute veto on the Home Rule. The House of Lords, you know, the upper chamber could actually block Home Rule down to 1911. Um, and it wasn't until the third Home Rule bill introduced by Herbert Asquith in 1912 with the support of the Liberals and their nationalist, if you like, allies, that Home Rule became a real possibility because by then the absolute veto of the Lords was gone they could only delay a bill for two years, making home rule with an automatic majority in the House of Commons um, inevitable, really, by 1914. So really, if you think about Ulster politics before 1886, it's very different to the kind of politics we've had since then, right down to the present day. Because you had the Conservative Party relying largely on the landlords, the downshires, the Brooks, the O'Neills, um, supported by elements of a fairly sort of low-level orange order um, from the early to the kind of late 19th century. On the other side, you had the Ulster Liberal Party, 
which was a, 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 an alliance of Presbyterians, Methodists in places like Fermanagh, and of course the, the Catholic uh, population of Ulster, which had been a slight majority until um, 1851 and then began to decline. And by 1911, the entire nine county province, um, historic Ulster, if you like, had a Protestant majority of about 57% in the nine counties, but obviously much more commanding as you went east of the River Ban and into the Belfast conurbation at this time. So when I say that Gladstone made home rule the touchstone of Irish politics, you have to remember that the failure of his first home rule bill not only caused riots on the Shankill Road, but of course, it also, if you like, consolidated an alliance between the British Conservative Party and Irish Unionists concentrated in the North. And they become by 1912-14 really the Ulster Unionists. And of course, for the Conservative Party, uh, the threat of home rule for Ireland threatened the empire. This was the, if you like, the thin end of the wedge. And the Tories were the party of um, the Union and the empire. And this alliance between the two was, if you like, symbolized by Lord Randolph Churchill's famous visit to Belfast, speaking in the Ulster Hall in February 1886, uh, with the serried ranks of um, the unionist industrialists, the strong farmers, the industrial workers, and the orange men in the audience. Uh, Winston Churchill's father proclaimed that um, uh, Ulster will fight and Ulster will be right. And this really was underwriting a check of support for Ulster unionism in the long struggle ahead. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. And of course, the, the, the founder of uh, uh, Irish unionism, or really Ulster unionism at this time, is this man, Colonel Edward Saunderson. He was a county cabin landowner. In fact, if you take the concession road from Clonus to Cabin today, you'll pass the ruins of Castle Saunderson and the once beautiful grounds of Saunderson's estate. Um, his gates are in the north, they're in Fermanagh, and the big house and the little Church of Ireland chapel where he actually preached of a Sunday are actually just a few yards on the Republic side of the border. But uh, he transformed himself from the 1870s as a Liberal MP for County Cavan, um, elected by um, both sections of the community, um, to an Orange Man and an Ulster Unionist MP for North Armagh by 1886. And what transformed Saunderson's liberalism into, uh, if you like, uh, strong unionism was the threat of home rule. For Saunderson and for people of his social class, the landed gentry, um, north and south of this undivided island at that time. There were two islands, Saunderson said in a famous speech in the House of Commons. There was loyal Ireland and disloyal Ireland. And he would never have accepted partition, which would have placed his cabin estates, of course, under a home rule flag had that come about. And he actually dies in 1906. And with his, his burial, attended by major public figures like Edward Carson, the two Craig brothers, um, both MPs, uh, James Craig, future Prime Minister Lord Craig Adam, and his brother Charles. They're actually not just burying the founding father of Ulster Unionism on his Cavan estate, on the southern kind of approaches to Ulster, but they're burying a kind of unionism, a unionism which was in the grip of the landed gentry, a gentry that was increasingly remote from social and economic changes on the land as tenant farmers demanded, if you like, tenant right, and then the ownership of their farms. This great revolution would be worked out on the Irish land uh, question by 1903. And on the other hand, you had the, the growth of the shock city of the Industrial Revolution. The city of Belfast, the fastest growing city in the United Kingdom or Ireland, with all the social problems, insanitary housing, tuberculosis, uh, where life was nasty, brutish and short, especially for women working in the unhealthy spinning rooms of the Belfast mills. Now, the landlords, symbolised by Colonel Saunderson, were remote from all that. And that was possibly going to alienate working class support and small farmer support for unionism. And the Craig brothers, um, James Craig and his brother Charles, they actually redefined unionism in 1905 when they launched the Ulster Unionist Council. 
And it's a kind of a coalition of all these interests, from the industrialists and the landlords to the professional classes, to the orange order, to the working men and the small farmers and the rest. And that is really the basis of Ulster unionism, which orange, with orangeism reviving in Belfast and across Ulster after 1886, really uh, providing the grassroots organisation or the social cement on which Craig and Carson will build their movement against the uh, Asquith Home Rule Bill. The next one, please. And I think it's a, it's a shot of Castle Saunders. And have a look at that castle, because in a castle not quite as grand, a big house in County Galway, Carson had his ancestral roots, as we shall see. The next one, please. And of course, the importance of orangeism, captured by the Belfast artist, Sir John Lavery, um, a Belfast Catholic of a working class background who became the society artist, um, featured in this period at every kind of uh, dining table um, in society, along with his beautiful wife, Lady Lavery. The next one, please. And just to remind us that not all Protestants were unionists. This is Richard McGee, or McGay as they would call him in Lurgan, who was actually one of the co-founders of the greatest trade union in Great Britain, the National Union of Dock Labourers. There are plaques and monuments to Richard McGee in Glasgow and in Liverpool, but he's forgotten in his native place, if you like. But Richard McGee, who went as a workman to work in Glasgow and then Liverpool, founded this great union, uh, which organised the, the dock uh, labourers and, of course, came back to Portadown and opened a factory employing 200 people, but became a Protestant nationalist MP. So just reminding us that a minority of Protestants, usually of independent means, clergy, lawyers, strong farmers, supported home rule for Ireland within the empire. The most eminent of those, of course, was William Lord Perry, who, of course, championed Belfast shipyard to its zenith uh, before the First World War. The next one, please. And of course, this is what Carson called, I suppose, the six plantation counties. Well, these are the six plantation counties. You'll notice that uh, Antrim, Down, and Monaghan were never officially planted. But Carson used that phrase after 1913, um, that the best acreage for a, an area separate from a Home Rule Parliament would be the six plantation counties. He means the, the present six counties. But remember, anywhere you find a royal school, as in Raffo, as in Cavan, as in Armagh, you find one of the original royal plantation counties. And from Adan and Monaghan were um, settled separately in a kind of private enterprise plantation. Uh, next one, please. Of course, the driving force in nationalism after 1900 was this man. After the fall of Parnell in 1891, um, who was brought down by the, his, his, his affair with Catherine O'Shea, an upper-class English woman, the Home Rule Party was shattered. It was in fragments. And it was John Redmond, a colleague of Edward Carson in the Four Courts in the 1880s, a man of a similarly conservative cast of mind. They were both imperialists. They both respected Westminster. They differed on the question of Irish self-government. John Redmond managed to reunite nationalism. It was mainly a, a middle-class Catholic movement, and he brought it to kind of the very kind of um, edge of success in 1912-14, forcing a liberal government which needed nationalist votes um, to introduce the third Home Rule Bill for all Ireland. John Redmond, of course, famously said, let us have Home Rule and imperial strength. And when he spoke, just to give you a sense of that period, on a platform on the Falls Road in 1914, for example, or in County Cork, he stood under two flags, the nationalist flag emblazoned with a harp and the Union Jack. The next one, please. But of course, these are the grand old men by this stage of Ulster Unionism. Carson was the first to die in 1935. An unusual partnership between the, the quintessential Southern Unionist, Carson, who was by birth, education, family, tradition, even um, his constituency for, you know, 25 years or more was a Dublin seat. And here you have the son of the wealthy distiller in East Belfast, uh, James Craig, inheriting £100,000 at the age of 21, a former soldier, a brilliant organiser, but a poor platform speaker. They were the men who made the running and brought us to unionism to its ultimate success with the establishment of Northern Ireland. 
The next one, please. So what can we say about these men? Well, remember that uh, if we just focus on this building for a moment, this is the headquarters of the Orange Order. No, it's not in central Belfast. It's in what's now called Parnell Square, uh, Dublin. Um, and of course, that was Orange headquarters to 1922. Remember, there were Orange lodges very strong in places like Wexford and Wicklow. And Wexford was the most orange county in Ireland in the late 18th and early 19th century, given the interest in Orangism in the landed gentry and its its supporters. So, of course, Carson and Craig were both born in a united Ireland um, in the second half of the 19th century, governed from Dublin Castle, um, with a cabinet minister in every cabinet known as the Chief Secretary for Ireland. And of course, with an all-Ireland police force, the Royal Irish Constabulary, all-Ireland courts. Nobody talked about Fermanagh and Tyrone before 1914. The unit, the legal unit, was Fermanagh and Monaghan. That was the Assizes unit. The other Assizes unit was Armagh and Loud. There were two councils met in the, in the centre of Derry, stroke London Derry, uh, in the Guildhall. You had London Derry number one, which was the city corporation, unionist until 1920. And you had London Derry number two, which governed the adjoining part of the Ligon in East Donegal, a very Presbyterian and unionist area. So, I mean, Derry uh, was locked into Donegal. Um, and the London Derry Port and Harbour Board, of course, ensured that the anchor liners from the United States came every fortnight and moored off Moville, bringing, of course, vast numbers of emigrants from Northwest Ireland to the United States. That continues down to the 1930s. So no one envisaged that the partition scheme, least of all Edward Carson, as he began his political career. The next slide, please. And here we have Carson, I suppose, captured at a noble moment in his history. This is 1914. Carson is now 16 years of age, and he's reviewing the serried ranks of the Ulster Volunteers, Carson's army, as they became known, outside a unionist icon at the time, the Old Town Hall, that sandstone former courthouse in Victoria Street there, near the law courts. And of course, this is Carson, who has almost become King Carson uh, in the north of Ireland. By the way, I'm not being political. Everybody called it the north of Ireland then. Every speech Carson made or Craig made down into 1921 talks about the people of the North of Ireland. The newsletter had a supplement every year called Industries of the North of Ireland. And the phrase echoed on. And if you go to Belfast City Hall, there's a little plaque beside the, um, the, the ornate chairs in which the King and Queen sat in 1921 at the opening of Parliament. And read that little uh, plaque carefully and it says, uh, here met the Northern Parliament of Ireland. So people weren't quite sure about the right nomenclature uh, even as late as 1921. Just moving on, please. And of course, the propaganda of this period. Let's just think about these two men, Carson and Craig. Well, first of all, let's ask ourselves a question. Why did the bulk of Ulster Protestants oppose home rule, which after all, was a very limited form of self-government? Remember, um, the British Parliament was still controlled, the commanding heights, finance, foreign affairs. The British Army would still be at Lisburn and the Curra. The Union Jack would still fly. Irish MPs would still sit in smaller numbers, admittedly, in Westminster. Um, the British Parliament would have the right to um, declare war and announce conscription. So, I mean, clearly, uh, Ulster opposition to Home Rule suggests, if you like, um, a long history of estrangement between the two traditions in Ireland, uh, going back certainly to the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, you can see that. Um, unionist fears turned around two things. Well, first of all, I think they, they liked the status quo. If we look at what the Belfast Chamber of Commerce told Gladstone, in 1893. This is the business class in the um, resurgent city. They said, all our progress has been made under the union. And so they felt, of course, Belfast Industries, linen, shipbuilding, engineering, and the rest, they were hardwired to the British Empire. And it's within that great, great free trade area, no, not the EU, but the British Commonwealth, the British Empire, that Belfast depended and feared, of course, that a Home Rule Parliament would undermine and secondly, of course, uh, Irish Protestants, but particularly those in the North, feared the consequences of Home Rule, that Home Rule would disrupt the industrial prosperity of the North, 
the Lagan Valley, the Bayan Valley, and in particular, that home rule would somehow result in Rome rule, that a Roman Catholic ascendancy uh, dominated by the Catholic hierarchy would uh, come to control Ireland. And this would be a new sectarian ascendancy to replace the old Protestant ascendancy, which had lorded over the Catholic masses during the penal era of the 18th century. And this had been highlighted uh, in Ireland by the application of the May Temeri decree by the Pope in 1908. Germany was exempted but Ireland was brought under this decree, which sought to regulate mixed marriages, of which there were always a number, even though they were frowned upon by both major religious denominations. And of course, in that situation, um, the uh, Catholic Church required that the, the, the partners were married um, in a Roman Catholic Church, and that the Protestant partner agreed that the children would be brought up as Roman Catholics. And of course, that was highlighted by the, the very murky uh, and indeed um, McCann case in Belfast in 1910, which effectively makes marriage couple. Mrs. McCann saw her husband depart with her children. She never saw them again. And Mrs. McCann became a kind of an unwitting weapon in the battle for and against home rule as that uh, kind of struggle reached a crescendo by 1914. Now, of course, Edward Carson was born into a very different island to James Craig. Carson was born in Dublin, in Harcourt Street, in the centre of the city, the fine Georgian house preserved now by the Irish government. He was born there in 1854. He was the son of a modestly successful architect and an aristocratic mother. Um, he was educated locally. He played in Stevens Green as a boy. And then he was sent off to Arlington College, which was a Church of Ireland public school in the Irish Midlands, in modern County Leash. And there he met his lifelong friends, the sons of rectors of the Church of Ireland, his church, and of course, the, the sons of doctors and lawyers. And your school friends are your friends for life. And that was the milieu. And those were the people that Carson represented uh, from 1892 to 1918 as MP for Trinity College, Dublin, the gleaming spires of Dublin University, as it was known. So he was quintessentially a Southern Unionist, but it was from his mother that Edward Carson really drew his main inspiration. His mother was Isabella Lambert. She was from a, a landed gentry family settled in County Galway by Cromwell in the 17th century. They had a fine mansion outside Athen Rye in County Galway called uh, Castle Ellen. You can still see it there today. And it was in that you know, forbidding big house, 18th century mansion, with the butler and the servants, that Carson spent his formative years. Every holiday, the locals got to know Ned Carson, but when he looked out the windows of the drawing room, light of evening, Lissadell, as Yeats wrote about another great house in the west of Ireland, he saw things that you wouldn't have seen from the um, uh, sort of south-facing windows of Craigavon on the shores of Belfast Lock. He saw young men playing hurling, uh, which was now being codified as part of the Gaelic revival by the Gaelic Athletic Association. And when he walked along the fields, and he did interact with the locals, we know that from um, local history in Galway, and um, he heard them speak Irish. So he was aware of different nuances. This was a differently accented island to that of um, Eastern Ulster, the, 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 the island of James Craig. Um, Carson's mother instilled in him a love of empire, um, an adherence to the British crown, and support for the Union and the landed interest, the landed gentry in Ireland. He went to Trinity, qualified as a lawyer. He wasn't a brilliant student out of school or university. I'd shown at university by the, the brilliant, literific Oscar Wilde. But he was a leading member of the HIST, the Trinity Historical Society, of which in previous generations, Wolf Tone and indeed Henry Grattan, the great Irish parliamentarians, uh, had, been, had been members. And he applied his skills there as an advocate eventually being called to the Irish bar uh, in 1877, taking every case he could get, um, going on the kind of uh, third class travel on the trains down to the Munster circuit practicing in Waterford. It was during that period that the 23 year old Edward Carson succeeded in getting an old lady off the hook. Miss Anthony kept getting on trains without a ticket, not recommended even on the Belfast Botanic to Hollywood line, but she kept being arrested and turfed off the train and eventually the railway company charged her. 
And the young uh, barrister from Dublin, Edward Carson, defended Miss Anthony. And uh, he used great forensic skill. He could play on a jury like a virtuoso. And soon the jury were weeping, you know, the brutal sight of this little old lady being cast off a train by a brutish porter representing the railway company. And having, of course, had the old lady acquitted uh, against all the evidence, he was chaired to his cheap digs around the corner, a cheap hotel. And that night a knock came upon his door. And the deputation had come from the local branch of the Irish Nationalist Party. And they said, Mr. Carson said, would you ever think of standing as our parliamentary representative uh, under Mr. Parnell in the next election? Here was Carson's chance to become another Parnell or to you know, be preferred to the bench uh, when the Nationalists were mixed in league with the British Liberals. But his words and allocation summed up his political, if you like, um, ideology, because he said to the deputation, thank you, but no thanks. The union is my guiding star. The union is my guiding star. In other words, the union between Great Britain and Ireland. Having said that, Carson was a liberal in politics. He was a member of the Liberal Party until uh, he broke with Mr. Gladstone in 1886 over Home Rule, which meant he had liberal views, much more liberal than those of the Ulster representatives he led. For example, Carson supported um, the Catholic Church's demand for a sectarian Catholic university for Ireland. He said, well, if they want it, they should be given it. And he had liberal views on other issues. Also, of course, the four courts of the Irish bar were a place where there were friendships which transcended politics. Um, he had a great respect for older barristers. Uh, he got to know Tim Healy, the famous maverick nationalist MP, um, who became a very able member of the Irish Bar. He got to know the young Dennis Henry um, from Draperstown in South Derry, South Londonderry, a, a Catholic unionist, very unusual at that time, applying his skill, who would later become both a unionist MP and um, Lord, First Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland. And of course, the, the island was divided into circuits. You had the North East Circuit, the North West Circuit, and of course, the, 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 the KCs and the uh, junior council would pass from town to town uh, during the assizes like a great medieval court, dining together in the evening. And if you were making money at it, it was a great life. Carson was becoming very successful. And um, so much so that this was the period of the land war in the 1880s. Home rule was in the back burner after Gladstone's first failure. And Carson was talent spotted by Arthur Balfour. He was the Chief Secretary for Ireland, um, but he was also, of course, to become British Prime Minister um, uh, in the, um, uh, from um, 1900 to 1905. And he saw Carson as perfect material for a Crown Prosecutor during the Land War. Carson, of course, was fearless in prosecuting those charged with um, uh, agrarian crime. And eventually, of course, um, Balfour persuaded Carson to uh, stand for Parliament. He found a safe constituency among the several hundred graduates of Trinity College. I mean, uh, uh, unlike political parties at the moment, but perhaps not all of them, um, there were no hustings as such. It was just a wine and cheese party to get elected in Trinity. Uh, it didn't have the, the bacchanalian roar of the hurly-burly of West Belfast, for example, in those days, uh, when the dead arose and appeared to many, many in those for election. Uh, Carson was, was, was very much a, um, a kind of... A, uh, a gin and tonic kind of um, kind of unionism, and he was returned to Parliament, becoming Solicitor General for Ireland in 1900, and then a more important job, Solicitor General for England in 1903. These were the last days of the uh, Conservative administration, which had turned its face against Home Rule as a threat to the Empire. And by 1906, the Liberals had returned in a landslide majority, the Tories were squeezed, and Carson, the lawyer with the Dublin accent, who had now moved to London with his, his, his young wife, Annette, and his family, became the man of the moment. He was the Tories expert on Ireland. Still practicing in the law courts, he would destroy Oscar Wilde in the 1890s in his defense of the Marquess of Queensbury uh, against um, a seditious libel. And of course, um, if you look at any book of famous lawyers of the Edwardian years, whether Carson's mentioned or not, his profile is always on the cover with wig and gown and that kind of censorious gesture, you know, Edward Carson becoming a major figure. 
Well, this is Carson, of course, entering politics. But what about James Craig? Because James Craig on the left is seen throttling Askell, treading Redmond underfoot. He's a man of a very, very different background. Craig, of course, was born into the family of a, a, a self-made man. His father was a traveller for Dunville's distillery, travelling throughout Ireland, staying, staying in cheap hotels and persuading um, people to buy this Belfast-generated whiskey. Um, he became a director. He became chairman of the board um, by the early 20th century. And Craig Avon was brought up in this business-like atmosphere with his brother Charles, his brother Vincent was an architect, the rest of the family. They had full and plenty a holiday home of Torella and County Down. And James Craig's Ulster was very much East Ulster, the Ulster of Belfast and Antrim and Down and maybe North Armagh. He talked about learning to ride a bike on Maharagallon Strand in Donegal, but I don't think it featured too much. Um, whereas for Carson, of course, the big house was important. And the big houses dominated West and uh, southwest Ulster in counties like Fermanagh, Calvin, and Donegal at this time. James Craig um, was sent to Merchants in School in Edinburgh, and he spoke with a clipped Ulster accent. You may have heard his dulcet tones recently, paying tribute to the late Lord Carson in 1935. You know, he said uh, something like, uh, Ireland was his background, Ulster was his cause, England was his home, but you could detect a sort of a, an upper class Ulster tone. Um, James Craig fought in the Boer War, bored by a business career as a stockbroker in London. He joined the Boer War, became a captain in the Royal Irish Rifles, and ended up as railway staff officer at Kronstadt in the early years of the 20th century. And it was there James Craig showed his meticulous flair for organisation. He wasn't a brilliant man, he wasn't university educated, but he was very, very astute. And he knew what he wanted, and he wanted to go into politics, following his elder brother, Charles, who was already a Westminster MP. He failed on his first outing in North Fermanagh. A Catholic Methodist uh, combination in favour of land reform defeated him there. But he was elected for East Down, uh, a, a safe unionist seat, in 1905. Uh, a, a, a House of Commons sketch writer in Punch wrote, he talked about the brogue-tongued Captain, clearly a reference to his accent, and his dreary drip of words. Craig wouldn't have been offended by that, because as the late Jonathan Bargain, historian of the province of Ulster, wrote, James Craig was signally uncharismatic. He wasn't a brilliant orator. He was a great organiser. He was a, strategi a strategist. But of course, he saw his own weakness. He would use the brilliance of Carson the kind of um, pulsating oratory of Carson to fill the, the gap as a foil to his kind of mediocrity as a platform speaker. And it was James Craig, of course, who had approached Carson in 1910. The background was, of course, the growing alliance between the Liberals, now led by Herbert Asquith, and the Nationalists. The Liberals, by and large, weren't, if you like, fanatical home rulers, but they wanted to stay in power. And, of course, they had lost two general elections in 1910, um, and they needed nationalist votes. And the deal, which Carson called a corrupt bargain, but it really wasn't because, you know, it's the two Westminster parties forging the lines, was to, um, if you like, repay nationalist votes, John Redmond's support, with home rule for the whole island of Ireland, which was the Gladstonian shadow of the 1880s. Carson, of course, was angry by this because he saw his own people in the South and West, his mother's people in Galway, his father's people in Dublin, becoming an insignificant minority in a nationalist-dominated Ireland. It's often been said of Carson, um, he was a great Irishman without being a nationalist because he really believed that the Union was best for Ireland in terms of economic, social and imperial benefits. That was his belief. He was less inclined to play the religious card than his Ulster Unionist colleagues um, in his political career. Craig approached Carson. Now, Carson was an interesting man for other reasons. The man that Craig would have seen on platforms extolling the benefits of the Union in his, you know, sort of uh, terse, lucid, compelling oratory, oratory you know, um, he would mesmerize mass audiences in Ulster in the critical years 1912 to 1914. 
But behind the scenes, Carson was a man of moods. He was a hypochondriac. He'd suffered from neurosis from an early age. Doctors today might say he suffered from manic depression. After the great speech, he would descend into the trough of despond. He would write that final letter to Craig. I am doomed. You must continue. But after three or four letters of this nature, um, the unionist leadership got to realize that he kept taking the tablets and lay in a darkened room for a while. He would recover because he was the, the front of house man for the unionist campaign. But to show you how different Carson was to Craig, Carson's first cousin was uh, uh, Mary Butler. Now, Mary Butler had Galen's house to name Myra de Butler. I'm not sure the union's name, Myra de Butler. But Mary Butler had joined the Gaelic League with many middle class Protestants, a member of the co founded by Douglas Hyde, um, a son of the Hydes of Castle Hyde in County Roscommon. Um, the idea was to revive Irish as a spoken language. And the Gaelic League would, uh, if you like, transform the atmosphere in pre 1916 Ireland, creating a new kind of nationalism based on language and uh, ethnic difference, if you like. But not only did Mary Butler, Carson's cousin, join the Gaelic League, but she went on to join a new party called Sinn Féin. In fact, it was she who gave name to Arthur Griffith's tiny and ineffective part of Sinn Féin, founded in 1905. She said she was very fond of her cousin Ned, which she called Sir Edward Carson. There was only one thing she couldn't stand about him. And no, you haven't guessed it. His terrible Dublin accent. That's what you could stand about him. So Carson, you know, had baggage that the people who cheered him at Balmoral or Kalibaki were unaware of. You know, he was a man from another place. But that was in many ways his appeal. He was the prophet from another country, it seemed. And of course, the lawyer with the Dublin accent, um, who was a key figure now in British society, sure footed in the corridors of power, respected. Uh, in the in the law courts, you know, um, hardwiring us to unionism, to the British conservative establishment. Now, if we look at the perspectives of these two men, James Craig wanted to preserve the union to save the Ulster he knew and loved, and that wasn't necessarily the historic province. Carson had a different strategy. He he reluctantly accepted the leadership of Ulster unionism. He called it the Irish Unionist Group, but it was effectively Northern Unionism in 1910 because he believed he could use Ulster as a weapon, a weapon to block the way to home rule completely, to defeat home rule. He believed Redmond would never accept a truncated island. That was very much his view. And he was convinced that the threat of partition would be enough to warn nationalists off, proceeding with this madcap scheme, as he saw it, of the green flag over Dublin Castle. Um, and so Carson agrees to take it on. But as in these years, you have, of course, the ratcheting up of Ulster resistance, because Carson and Craig realized the battle had been lost at Westminster. It was an automatic nationalist majority. And they were backed, of course, by Andrew Bono Law, the son of a co reign Presbyterian minister who thought and, you know, who fought ahead as an Ulster Unionist. And yet this renewed the alliance of 1885. And very quickly, of course, Craig arranged the Ulster Covenant, this great quasi-religious occasion. Can we see the next slide, please, um, uh, Louise? Thank you. And um, we move to the Ulster Hall. And there's Carson, the first to sign a covenant, which will be signed by over 400,000 men and women. The women signed an alternative uh, declaration because they hadn't the right to vote. And Carson didn't support their right to vote since public opinion was divided, political opinion was divided. But this is Carson signing the covenant, one of a small minority of non-Ulster men to sign it. It put the case against Tom Rule. And of course, it reserved the right to invoke the use of force against the third Home Rule Bill when it became law. And of course, this is quite serious because of course, this is challenging the King and Parliament. Now, David Dutton, an historian of British conservatism, has written that in supporting Ulster resistance to the, the point of military resistance to Home Rule, the British conservatives are really straining the bonds of the British constitution. And of course, no one really talks today about Bono Law in that period. The Tories have kind of 
relegated to the background. They're more likely to talk about the Israeli, Israeli and one nation Toryism, or Winston Churchill um, and the bulldog spirit of World War II. A few people mentioned Bono Law, who's passed into history as the unknown prime minister. But of course, it's on foot of the covenant that a new citizen's army emerges in the Orange Hall, the estates of friendly landowners, the Ulster Volunteers, formed in January 1913. Can we see the next slide, please? And here we have an image of the, I mean, this is Bono Law addressing a great meeting at Blenheim Palace, and he said he could envisage no st stretch of resistance to which Ulster would not go, in which the Conservative Party would not be prepared to support them. Massive support then for the Unionist cause, whatever about today. The next one, please. And of course, the covenant itself, the personalised um, copy signed by, uh, I think in this case, Edward, uh, that's... Um, so J.M. Andrews. Next one, please. And here's the long gun running, because, of course, it was Carson who very reluctantly, because he, in Carson, you had the lawyer at all for the rebel, he authorised the long gun running of 1914, which brought 35,000 German rifles to northern Irish soil, distributed throughout the nine counties of Ulster. 2,000 rifles went to County Monaghan. Lord, the Earl of Leitrim was involved in distributing to the, the Protestant minority in County Leitrim, apart from the nine counties of Ulster. Uh, and of course, the UVF soon became 90,000 strong looking to Carson for leadership, drilling and training. But unwittingly, Carson had done something else when he invoked the use of force. And this didn't come easily to a man who was racked by, you know, uh, hypochondria during this period. He couldn't sleep, he couldn't eat. And he was delighted when the weak liberal government failed really to arrest him in 1914. But Carson had unwittingly re reignited the Fenian flame of Irish nationalism. Within nine months, Owen McNeill from the Glens of Antrim, a cultural nationalist, had praised Carson's army in an article called The North Began. And if you like, pressured by the Irish Republican Brotherhood, McNeill founded an Irish nationalist force called the Irish Volunteers. By 1914, you had two rival armies in places like Dungannon, Newry, West Belfast. These armies were in competition. What if a shot was fired? If a collision occurred, civil war might break out because at this time, Home Rule was eluding all compromise. Carson was now talking about some form of exclusion. The British Liberals were talking about county option, which Carson rejected because it was only a temporary solution. The counties which elected out of Home Rule, counties like Armagh and Antrim, for example, would, of course, revert to Home Rule after six years. Carson called it a stay of execution. Tensions were rising, rising in Ireland. And, of course, the storm clouds of the Great War were gathering, especially after the assassination in Sarajevo in June 19. 14. It's in the last days of peace that the king, George V, that key figure, calls a peace conference at Buckingham Palace. Carson, Redmond, Lord George, and of course, Bono Law attend. And they pour over maps uh, of the province of Ulster based on the 1911 census and its religious question. Carson said later that on the question of demographics, the Ulster Unionist leaders went into the question almost parish by parish and town land by town land. Carson was now in a position he'd never expected to be. He was having to facilitate a partition scheme he had only ever seen as a tactic. He was mindful of slowly abandoning his own people in the South and West, whom he represented in Parliament in his Dublin seat. On one occasion, he turned on an, Ulster, on a, on an Irish Unionist, a Southern Unionist deputation to Westminster. And as they said, you can't abandon us, you must keep Ireland united under the crown, partition would be worse than home rule. He said, am I to abandon Ulster because you have lost? So by the logic of his argument, Carson has been propelled to seek the best deed he can for his unionist clients. But he does it reluctantly, very reluctantly does he abandon um, Galway and Dublin and Cork. And he'll be haunted by it for a very long time. And then the Great War breaks out and Carson and Redmond shake hands and they exhort their rival armies to support Britain's war effort. For Carson, the 36th Ulster Division of the UVF became our fighting for Crown and Empire and Ulster. For Redmond, the Nationalists and the Connacht Rangers and the rest are fighting for the freedom of small nations and the Irish Home Rule. 
And of course, there's a trust during the war, as the Irish question, if you like, is, if you like, kicked into touch. Home rule becomes law. It's passed on to the statute book, but it's suspended for the war. And everybody knows it will be accompanied by some kind of exclusion, some kind of partition. The next one, please. During the war, of course, a coalition is formed. Carson becomes, of course, first of all, um, he becomes Attorney General. He becomes First Lord of the Admiralty, a member of the War Cabinet. He's not a good administrator. And Craig is still the kind of backroom boy. Carson summed it up very well. He said that, I rely on James Craig so much. He knows these people so well. Because Carson was almost a foreigner um, in Antrim, Don, Armagh, Fermanagh, staying in the big houses, Castle Cool, um, Mount Stuart, uh, becoming friendly with Lady Londonderry, um, who, whom he, to whom he expressed his family problems. By 1913, at the height of the Home Rule crisis, Carson's wife was dying. Annette Cowan, the daughter of a police inspector whose um, uh, marriage to Edward was frowned upon by the Carson family. Um, uh, she, of course, uh, pined for Dublin and semi-detached land. She didn't like these great dinners at London Dairy House with lords and ladies. His sons uh, and children basically give him a lot of trouble. My children are a rum lot, he told me in London Dairy. Eventually, he would only accept a life peerage because he feared that his family might discredit his name posthumously. Um, they had been kicked out of school. They were drinking. There were problems. But then, as a public man, he couldn't be there. Um, at the bar of the House of Commons, and at the bar, uh, it was difficult to be all the places a father needed to be. His young wife died. He met uh, a younger woman in her 30s at a spa in Germany. And of course, she Ruby became his second wife. Tensions in the family between her and the older daughters. Uh, but she would um, uh, 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 deliver him of a son, Edward. Um, uh, shortly after their marriage. And of course, she lived into the 60s and gave us such an insight into Carson in this period. The next one, please. But of course, no one expected the bolt from the blue, the Easter rising in 1916, which transforms everything. A shift from nationalism, the undermining of home rule. Carson and Redmond forged an agreement in 1916. They had been misled by Lord George. Carson was offered six counties excluded from home rule under London. No storm. Redmond was told, that exclusion would be a temporary thing. They were defeated by the Southern Unionists, led by Lord Lansdowne, who actually stepped Tory nerves jungly and said this was a surrender to the force of the Rising uh, and the Rising's leaders, and the scheme fell through. Carson was, was weakened. In the last years of the war, there's drift between Carson and the Ulster Unionists. He, for example, encouraged the Unionists in 1917 to enter the Irish Convention. The reason being, um, American opinion had to be conciliated. America had been brought into the war and it must, America must be persuaded that Britain was addressing the Irish question on lines akin to self-determination, a phrase invented by President Wilson, the American president at this time. Carson also came up with the idea of an all-Ireland council, which would become the Council of Ireland in the, in the 1920 Act. This wasn't universally um, admired by Ulster Unionists at the time. Carson's becoming elderly, he's becoming frailer, he's becoming more hesitant, his depression is increasing, something that will haunt him to his dying day. The next one, please. Craig's coming more into his own, and of course, republicanism has found a new hero leader in Eamon de Valera, elected for East Clare, the senior surviving commandant of the Easter Rising, who actually escaped the firing squad as the British policy changed. And Sinn Féin is beginning to, if you like, um, overwhelm the Home Rule Party. Um, whose mandate is now exhausted under John Redmond, John Dillon, and the Northern Nationalist leader, Joe Devlin. The next one, please. And of course, this is the, 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 the noble election, the seminal election of 1918, which sees the Sinn Féin landslide in the South and West. Most seats are uncontested. Sinn Féin, in the area which approximates to the Irish Free State of 1922, gets 65% of the vote. The Home Rule Party collapses. Uh, protected in the North by a, an electoral pact brokered by Cardinal Logue with Sinn Féin, only Joe Devlin, defeating De Valera in Belfast Falls, holds on to a seat, and he leads a little nexus of home rulers um, 
opposing partition and the British government's uh, military policy in the new parliament. But notice how Ulster unionism is consolidating. The most significant thing about uh, that election in unionist terms is that Carson migrates from Dublin to Belfast, Dunkirk. Dun Dun in the words of the provost of TCD, he has sought a slum constituency in Belfast. And the provost was a Donegal man, so I should have used the Daniel O'Donnell accent. A slum constituency in Belfast. So there it is. Um, and Carson moved to Dunkirk. He hires Mount, uh, Mount Vernon, a big house in North Belfast, for three weeks during the campaign. But as his biographer, Alvin Jackson, writes, in Belfast, Carson found a tomb, eventually, but he never found a home. And he found the hurly-burly of that election in which engineers and shipyard workers were demanding the 44-hour week and asking him if he supported it. When the nationalists were saying that Carson had never made a democratic vote in his life, when Joe Devlin was using Carson's conservative record to embarrass him in the public space. And of course, uh, Carson made an attack on Major William Davy, the nationalist candidate, a Protestant home ruler, whom he accused of being a fellow traveller with Sinn Féin. Davy was about barrister who was honoured in the war and badly wounded. He sued Carson in the Dublin courts and received an apology and minor damages in 1919. But Carson was now receding into the background, still titular leader. It was the almost 50-something James Craig who was coming into his own. The next one, please. And it's in the next few years that, of course, things move rapidly. Sinn Féin abstains from Parliament, declares, redeclares the Republic and establishes a Republican Doyle in Dublin seeing the whole of Ireland as the territory of the Republic. The IRA campaign takes off. The War of Independence begins. Tensions begin to rise in the north as the demob soldiers return home into a post-war employment slump. And, of course, IRA attacks in Ulster begin to intensify, even in Antrim and Down in this period. The next one, please. Um, and these years, of course, see mounting sectarian violence particularly in Belfast, where 500 people die and something like eight to 9,000 Catholics are driven from their work in 1920, where in fact a new police force is formed at James Craig's uh, request, the Ulster Special Constabulary, the UVF transformed. I think this cartoon tells us a lot. Lloyd George, the rising liberal home ruler of 1912, is now a prime minister of a coalition government dominated by the Conservatives. Um, the manifesto of Lloyd George and Bono Law, who's co-prime minister, really ensures the self-determination of the six counties. The Tory liberal manifesto states they must not be coerced under a Dublin parliament against their will. So we have this name checking of the six counties. However, uh, a committee is set up as the map of Europe is being redrawn by Lloyd George and his allies. Uh, the Long Committee, chaired by a former Irish unionist called Walter Long, an Anglo-Irish unionist, it proposes partition, two Irish parliaments, limited powers, and of course, the big a Council of Ireland linking them with Craig ensures it has limited powers over railways and fisheries and the like. But the Long Committee, composed of liberals and conservatives who differed in their view of Ireland, proposes a nine-county Northern Ireland. This, of course, will ensure a, a very narrow unionist majority of 57% to 43%, with uh, overwhelmingly Catholic majorities west of the River Ban, not just in Fermanagh and Tyrone and the Maiden City, but in Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal. This is a sore point for unionists, those 80,000 loyalists who had supported the covenant in the three outlying counties. Here's a chance to include them in the state. Craig intervenes dramatically on the 13th of November, um, 19, um, uh, 1919, and he makes it clear uh, he prefers six counties to the nine county province because Protestant representation would be strengthened. Now, Carson has mixed views on the Government of Ireland Act, which is shortly to go through the Commons, uh, embracing these changes. He can't accept a Belfast Parliament again and again in the debates. He's um, uh, uh, you know, at, 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 at loggerheads with his fellow Ulster Unionists in that he keeps questioning the need for a parliament um, and questions whether home rule or rather, rather direct rule from London would not be the best form of bringing the north of Ireland into the imperial fold. The Long Committee still recommends nine counties, but Craig's pressure has worked. It's overturned in the full cabinet. The Government of Ireland Act goes through its stages it's during that debate we have Craig Carson and the 23 Ulster Unionists in the House of Commons. 
Three of the unionists are junior ministers. Um, they include James Craig and Sir Dennis Henry, who's the Attorney General for Ireland, the Catholic unionist lawyer. Um, Craig uses his influence as a parliamentary secretary at pensions and then at the Admiralty to shape the bill. And he manages, if you like, to heavily influence the only whom Home Rule Act ever to become law. Carson, of course, is aware of the minority majority situation in the South. He was a member of that eternal minority. But it's interesting how in the House of Commons, um, demands by Joe Devlin and the handful of nationalists for PR, for a weighted nationalist representation in the second chamber, both parliaments, North and South, will have a, a Senate. Um, they're voted down by Carson and Craig and their supporters, whereas Carson demands that the Southern Senate for the Southern Unionist minority of 10, 12 percent, um, will be half its representatives would be from the Protestant minority. And of course, for the next 15, 20, 15 years, the uh, Senate of the Irish Free State is chaired by a former Unionist MP and includes the gentry, Jameson, the whiskey distillers, uh, church leaders and the rest. Uh, Carson has ensured, if you like, a measure of protection for his own people but he doesn't see the need for the one-third minority who are resisting partition. For Joe Devlin, the 1920 Act is the worst form of partition and, of course, permanent partition and the nationalist opposite. The bill goes forward. We'll see the next slide. And, of course, we move rapidly. Craig realises the need to get this up and running. And this is his business sense that he learned at his father's boardroom table. He insists on two things, a special constabulary, 32,000 strong. He realized that the border would be resisted in South Fermanagh, South Armagh, the bog side, Newry and South Down, because the people there didn't want a border. And uh, they're mainly nationalists. And this can only be achieved by, if you like, um, a, a major paramilitary presence in those areas. Churchill supports the, the formation of the USC because it will free up police and troops for battle against the IRA in the South. Lord George, though, compares the Ulster Specials as to the Fascisti, those kind of groups of Mussolini supporters, partisans in Italy. So there are mixed feelings on it. It's a big success for Craig. It mops up the demobbed soldiers, the unemployed um, shipwrights of Belfast in 1920, 1922. Um, and of course, without the Specials, Northern Ireland could not have been created, no doubt about that. But they're regarded by the nationalist population, of course, with a hatred resembling that with which the black and tans were regarded in the South because they're an exclusively Protestant force. The other thing Craig insists on is an undersecretary for Ireland. The next slide, please. And this, uh, I think, we're, uh, yes, um, he's a man called Sir Ernest Clark, and he draws up all the plans for a separate cabinet, separate courts, and indeed elections in May 1921. Carson is now on the brink of retiring. In fact, in February, he stands down, declining, though it's only a, uh, it's only a symbolic offer the Premiership of Northern Ireland. He's not going to preside over the ruins of his own policy. And Carson retires to become a law lord. James Cray becomes Prime Minister designate. In that election of May 1921, under the Government of Ireland Act, he calls for um, a total unionist turnout to prevent, as he puts it, the submergement of the six counties in a Dublin parliament. He said men are either for the Republic or for the Empire. He does meet Eamon de Valera in Dublin, though, for four hours on the 5th of May, a tantalising meeting. He's acting as the kind of cat's paw for Lord George, who is offering peace feelers to Sinn Féin in the spring of 1921 with a view to settling the Irish question when the Ulster question is settled. They don't agree on anything, but Lord George knows a bit more about de Valera's bottom line. Craig takes a bit of stick at home for this. For the nationalists, of course, um, partition means national suicide, Joe Devlin says. The Sinn Féin under de Valera and the nationalists under Devlin, they campaign against partition and they take a leaf out of the Ulster Covenant. They refuse to recognise the authority of the new parliament, which is what the Ulster Union has said they would do in the event of a Dublin parliament. And of course, therefore, when the parliament is finally convened in Belfast City Hall, on the 22nd of June, 1921, by the King and the Queen. The King's about to make his grandiloquent gesture, the King's speech. There are no Catholics, no nationalists there at all in the audience. Just Craig, his cabinet, their wives, dignitaries, the Lord Lieutenant, Lord Fitzalan. He's the only, the first Catholic uh, viceroy since the Act of Union. But the King is determined to use his speech as an olive branch to Sinn Féin. He calls on Irishmen to forgive and forget, 
to stretch out the hand of forbearance and reconciliation. The king was not impressed by the draft speech Craig had provided. According to Lord Stamford, the royal secretary, he said that he was very distressed by Craig's speech. He said he was trying to make me, quote unquote, the mouthpiece of Ulster when I want to be the voice of empire. The king's speech, overwritten by Lloyd George, by General Smuts, who had met de Valera and others, transformed the relationship between Britain and Sinn Féin. Within two weeks, there's a truce, de Valera's in London, Dominion status is on the cards, and Craig has now established his own parliament. But as we'll see in the coming weeks, the real challenge for Craig was to accommodate the one-third minority who found themselves where the Ulster Unionist feared they would be um, in the decade after 1910. And of course, it is often said about Craig that he had, uh, he, 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 he maintained the union, but he didn't strengthen it. Now, of course, the policy of the unionist government has to be seen in terms of massive violence in Belfast. Um, uh, you have the um, re refusal of the minority to recognize the state, the refusal of teachers to recognize the new Ministry of Education and so on. There's another slide that may help us here. We can see the unionist cabinet just before I finish. Uh, I think there's another slide coming up uh, with Louise. Uh, well, this is Joe Devlin, Nurse Devlin abstaining, the cartoons they had in those days. Uh, the next one, please. Um, and this is Craig and his cabinet. Craig chose his cabinet from the different segments and sectional interests within unionism. On the far right, as we look at the picture, you can see John Miller Andrews, the linen magnate, and the descendant of the United Irishman, Dr. William Drennan, a capable minister of labor, um, a firm unionist, but someone who tried to make um, the Craig Collins Pacts work in the early 1920s. Beside him is E.M. Archdale, a shy, retiring aristocrat from Castle Archdale and County Fermanagh, appropriately Minister of Agriculture. Um, uh, Craig in the middle, the old man is actually Hugh Pollock, the Minister of Finance, a Liberal unionist who actually was very friendly with Joe Devlin. Craig who was quite friendly with Joe Devlin, and then Lord Londondale who had become Air Minister in Britain in the 30s. Londonderry was a man of much larger vision. It was said he'd one foot in the 18th century and one foot in the 23rd century. He believed the problems in Ireland could be solved by non-denominational education. And as education minister, he proposed to take religion out of the schools and the church's management of schools. But of course, he would be resisted by the churches and would resign his policy in ruins in 1925, and we had the endowment of Protestantism by the state, in that state schools, of course, were effectively Protestant schools uh, under the control of the Protestant churches who had founded them. But the British government would have preferred if Londonderry had been in charge of home affairs, policing, the electoral system. Instead, that fell to the man on the far left, the narrow-minded Sir Edward Dawson, Sir Richard Dawson Bates, who was very much an, an apparatchik of the UVF or the Austro Unionist Council. In the words of a visiting British civil servant, he was a weak man and a political hack. He regarded all nationalists as enemies and all um, nationalists as suspect. He refused to use the telephones installment in 1932 because he heard a Catholic telephonist had been appointed. And so while Craig had a desire to do the right thing, um, he was not beyond encouraging the shipyard workers in 1920 in his famous speech when he said, after the expulsion of Catholic workers, do I agree with you boys did? Yes. Now he's saying this as a minister of the Admiralty. And certainly it doesn't smack of a prime minister for all the people. The problems were enormous. The challenges were enormous. The nationalists did not want the state. And in the months ahead, the treaty would try to overcome partition, creating a threat to its existence. And of course, Michael Collins and de Valera would in their own way support the Northern Nationalists in their campaign of non-recognition. So another year or more of violence would continue despite the King's plea for conciliation. Carson would look back in anger. In a speech on the Irish Treaty of 1921, he would say, what a fool I was. I was only a puppet and so was Ulster and so was Ireland in the game that was to bring the Conservative Party into power. Words, words quoted by uh, Anne Blackford, the Scottish nationalist in the Brexit debate um, a couple of years ago. Nonetheless, Carson retiring to the Isle of Thanet, looking back in anger at and a sense of failure as having failed to save his own people in the South. Yet, in many ways, we have to see the, the statue which Carson unveiled to his own memory at Stormont, as not so much a monument to his political success, but a tombstone to his political failure. 
to save the whole of Ireland under the Union John. It's really Craig's statue in the stairwell that represents the real founding father of Northern Ireland. And he was to die in 1940. Um, but it couldn't be said that he had actually strengthened the Union. Thank you very much. Okay, Eamon, thank you very, very much, Eamon, for that. Once again, an excellent lecture, apart from the uh, personation of uh, Daniel O'Donnell. <laughs> thank you, have a steady, good job. A good, steady day job. Um, thank you very much. Don't give up the day job. <laughs> Don't give up. Yeah, thanks for an excellent, uh, an excellent lecture. A lot of information, a lot of insights, and very, very well presented as always. We we'll have a couple of questions already lodged with us, and one of them was in regard to the, the whole question of home rule equals Rome rule, which would have been a, a catch cry at the time and probably for a long time afterwards, actually. Um, but the question would be, would um, obviously make the, make the feelings or concerns of unionism have been impacted differently had the role of the Catholic Church not perhaps been as strong as it was at that period? Absolutely. I think one of the problems of Irish politics as we went into the 20th century on the island was that both major political tendencies, nationalist and unionist, had been heavily influenced by their alignment with religion in both cases. Daniel O'Connell was uh, loyal to the Crown, espoused Queen Victoria, wasn't a bigot personally, but he built his movement in the 1820s and 30s, his movement for Catholic emancipation, which many Protestants supported, um, uh, including Henry Montgomery, the famous non-subscribing Presbyterian minister. He based that largely on the Catholic masses with the support of the Catholic Church. And Parnell inherited that kind of party in home rule where priests were prominent in local national associations. And Joe Devlin would promote the ancient order of Hibernian, which was a, a secret um, Catholic political sectarian society, which rivaled the Orange Order. But then we look on the other side. Henry Cook, of course, in 1834, warned the Protestants of Ireland that they must hang together or they would hang separately later. They must oppose liberalism, nationalism, and popery. And so unionism, as it emerges in the 1880s, is very much aligned with the Protestant churches and with the Orange Order. It made someone like Sir Dennis Henry, a, ca a Catholic unionist, sit very uneasily within that group, although he was elected as a unionist MP uh, in his native south, uh, Derry, struck London Derry in 1916. Um, and of course, on the other hand, the, the tone of nationalism made it difficult for Protestant home rulers like Armour of Balamani or Lord Pirrie. But of course, just as the home rule question is bursting on the stage and these allegations are being made, nationalists say, no, 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 home rule will not be home rule, will be treated fairly. But they haven't ensured that safeguards are in the act. It's only after a massive campaign by unionists very late in the day at the Irish Convention that the nationalists offer the unionists 40% of the seats in an Irish parliament. Now they do that. That's one of the recommendations of the, the nationalist report in the Irish Convention. Unionists turn it down, they want the union, they don't want any part of home rule. Um, but the Ne Temere decree, which was, if you like, um, applied to Ireland and dramatised by the McCann case of 1910. Just think about it. The McCann's living on the Falls Road. He's a carpenter from Ballymena. His wife, Agnes Jane Barclay, is from Ballymena. Um, they have three small children. Um, allegedly, a priest visited the house and told Mrs. McCann, who had been married to her husband in a Presbyterian church, she was living in sin, must remarry and sign a paper saying she's going to bring her, her children up as Catholics. Uh, this is highlighted at the time. McCann leaves his wife, but he takes his children with him. And they have one last sad meeting at the black man statue in which she pleads, if you don't want me, please give me back my babies. She never sees them again. She doesn't get it to Queen Nisi to 1940. I, and of course, we know now that Alexander McCann took his son to America and his daughter was actually reared near Lisburn with a Catholic family and uh, uh, her family have ended up in Australia. Both sides have contacted me uh, and said, you know, we are the McCanns. I believe there was a bit of trouble about 100 years ago. I didn't like to tell them the whole story. So you have that scenario there. So the Nate Temery decree bursting on the state between 1912 and 14, um, uh, you know, it informs the oratory of Carson and Craig and Londonderry. And on the other side, the defence of the Catholic Church and the defence of Nate Temere is kind of, you know, being dredged up by nationalist leaders. And it's a bad omen as far as unionism is concerned for a united self-governing island. Thanks, Eamon, for that, uh, for the answer for that. Again, very enlightening.
Um, a couple of other questions. One from Jeremy, um, and his question is: What was what was public opinion in uh, in Britain in regard to the partition question? Public opinion was divided. Uh, it was actually um, uh, Lloyd George who famously said that the British working class had never been united on the Irish question. It's true that Scots Presbyterians, who were invariably liberal, they supported Home Rule for Ireland. But they wanted to get the question out of the way, as most British liberals did, to focus on the domestic agenda and the reforms of the new liberalism, which had brought old age pensions and national insurance and education acts and all that kind of thing. But you have this gulf between uh, Ulster unionism and Scottish Presbyterianism. I mean, I know there was a fissure a few years ago over same sex marriages, and I think the, um, the Scots Presbyterian delegates uh, walked out of the General Assembly in protest. But that was dramatized, you know over a hundred years ago in that cleavage. The unionist, uh, the also unionist orators made uh, really um, uh, poor inroads in Scotland, trying to convince the Scots Presbyterians that home rule would mean wrong rule. Um, the British working man, certainly uh, the Labour Party emerging at this period with about 30, 40 seats in the parliament after 1919, soon to become a minority government. The Labour Party had a large Irish base and certainly supported Ireland's claims to home rule. Asquith um, and a large section of liberalism also supported the idea of dominion home rule for all Ireland by this stage as well. But working class opinion was divided. I mean, Protestant feeling was still strong in Britain. You know, uh, that was a factor. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when it came to the uh, conservative establishment, um, the officer corps of the British Army, going back to the Curra incident of 1914, people like Sir Henry Wilson, Lord Kitchener, they were supporters of the Unionist cause. And the men of the Shires, personified by Walter, Walter Long, who was a, um, a, a London MP, very much personified that sort of uh, umbilical cord which existed between us, us to unionism and British conservatism uh, down to 1973, when they broke with Edward Heath over Sunningdale. Yeah, thank you, Eamon. Uh, I have a question from Paul Nugent, just from uh, South East Connecticut, actually, but they're obviously an Irish name. So uh, his question would be around, what would, Eamon, what would you think, this is difficult to speculate, of course, had the Anglo-Irish Treaty at the time resulted in a single island, an all-Ireland unit, for example, uh, an independent Ireland of 32 counties, what, what may have been the shape of things to come at that point in time in your estimation? Well, I mean, of course, the whole of Ireland was included in the Irish Free State, something we tend to forget uh, on the 6th of December 1921. There was automatic inclusion, which Craig bitterly resented for, I mean, people in Cullibaki and, you know, Ballin the Mallard were briefly for a year uh, citizens of the Irish Free State, although the power of the Dublin Parliament couldn't apply there. But the North was allowed to opt out when the Act became law, and she opted out with alacrity on the 7th of December 1922, possibly the real date of the birth of Northern Ireland, just to confuse the issue further. But as I say, um, let's think about it. There had been massive sectarian violence in Belfast. There had been a civil war in Derry in May 1920. 500 people died violently in Belfast. Um, eight to 9,000 Catholics had been driven from their work and they, they, they suffered the bulk of the casualties, nearly 60% of deaths for a population of one quarter in Belfast. And even though the IRA were active, they were the least armed. Uh, so we have that sort of scenario. Is it likely that if the uh, Michael Collins's National Army, recruited from the pro-treaty IRA, had been given an official remit over the whole of Ireland, um, to establish an Irish free state, that you wouldn't have had a civil war, a different kind of civil war, perhaps. A civil war that almost happened in the uh, swamps of Loch Ireland, as Lord George put it, at the Battle of Pettigo in 1922. I mean, certainly the problem is that there had been no reconciliation. And had there been, I mean, Cara Healy, who was a journalist and a Sinn Féin leader in Fermanagh, in fact, one of the founders of Arthur Griffith's party, he was there in 1905 with Carson's cousin, Myra de Butler, um, in the um, rotunda when Sinn Féin was born for the first time. And uh, he said afterwards, you know, the biggest mistake that the nationalists made was not to accept the liberal offer of the Irish Council Act of 1907 because it fell short of home rule, but it proposed to establish a council with control of several Irish departments, with Irish representatives from the 32 counties. And his view was that if that had gone off the ground, 
It couldn't have been blocked by unionism. I mean, there was already an, an All Ireland Department of Agriculture and technical instruction in Dublin, which was chaired by a unionist MP, uh, Hugh Barry, in his last couple of years. And if that council had continued to develop very low level, kind of semi-devolution, and had gained confidence, that might have led through time into greater All-Ireland structures. That was the view of a former Republican and indeed a member of the IRA in the War of Independence years. Okay, Eamon, thank you. You have another question from Neil House, actually, which is about what happened to those left behind and the other three remaining uh, counties of Ulster. Funny enough, last night I was Zooming to a group at Manor Hamilton and County Leitrim based in a, in a Methodist church who brought together people from Fermanagh, Leitrim, Cavan and South Donegal. We have a lot of people in the room discussing the impact of partition on ordinary people, on the localities in that area. And of course, think about it. I mean, uh, for them, it was a, an act of betrayal, the abandonment of the three counties. Yes, they had been academically abandoned in 1916 under the six county scheme, but they had voted to stay outside the excluded area in the interest of the empire. But in 1920, Craig was offered nine counties. Um, many British ministers felt that would be more defensible in the eyes of world opinion. And anyway, it would facilitate Irish unity at an early date because the Catholic birth rate was so much higher in those days than the, the Protestant birth rate. Um, and um, uh, uh, they felt that this was their opportunity. Lord Farnham of uh, Cavan and Michael Knight, a clone the solicitor, led a rearguard action. Having lost the vote in February, they demanded um, a, a resumed meeting of the Unionist Council in, 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 in May, and they were voted down by a Belfast group and abandoned. They weren't quite abandoned, though. They were allowed to join the Ulster Specials, just reading today, a special killed uh, this day, 100 years ago, uh, in County Tyrone, was a native of Drum, County Monaghan, which is, it had its own UVF um, kind of police force during this whole period to protect um, an identifiably Protestant village outside the northern area. Um, but of course, uh, they would come under pressure during the War of Independence. A um, lot of sectarian violence in the area around Rosselais. UVF men from Monaghan burned the village of Rosselais when the IRA wounded a leading unionist. And then the IRA retaliated by shooting leading members of the UVF and the B-Specials in Fermanagh and Monaghan. And eventually a peace conference was held around this time, a hundred years ago, <coughs> in involving all major interests and churches to try to staunch that violence. I mentioned this in the board, and people then began to talk because it's something perhaps that had been buried in folk memory. It was so hurtful to remember. There were problems. And what you find is by the 1926 census, those details are sadly burned by a unionist government that wanted to save space in Stormont. Um, we find more uh, Southern Protestants from outside the six counties living at County Fermanagh in the 1926 census, from as far away as West Cork. Uh, we find people from Leash, uh, from Cavan, Monaghan, Leach, and Sligo in Fermanagh. Uh, we have that there. Uh, a number of them left, of course, and they migrated north. And um, uh, the people most hit, I think, were the unionists of the Ligon and County Donegal. They were the big farmers just uh, west of Derry. They had had their own council, London Derry Number 2, which catered for Rafo and Carrigans and foe and they met in the guild hall and they were suddenly told in May 1922 bye bye lads you're joining Letter Kenny. Well this was a hammer blow for Protestants and Unionists who had the biggest farms in Donegal, the richest land in most um, in Ulster you might say. And uh, they said but we we don't want to go to Letter Kenny. It's a Sinn Fein council. And they were forced to go to Letter Kenny, abandon the guild hall, the old uh, court system where Donegal cases were held in Derry, even court martials in the War of Independence, uh, where the London Derry Port and here's another blunder, the London Derry Port and Harbour Board, um, not anticipating partition in 1920, had opened a brand new hospital in North Donegal called the Ballyratton Intercepting Hospital outside Moville. It's still there now, it's a private house, I know it well. And the idea was that as the anchor liners came in from uh, New York, um, because of communicable diseases, the COVID-19 of the day, they would drop off people who had black tongues and the like, uh, and they would be brought to Ballyratton uh, for uh, 40 days uh, quarantine, um, which is what they did in those days. But almost as soon as the hospital was built, with its doctor and medical staff appointed, suddenly the North found itself severed from Donegal by partition. And for the next 15 years, the London Dairy Port and Harbour Board, every 
August, took um, a, a charabite, that's what you travelled on in those days in style, to Mohill. They had high tea in Keevney's Hotel, and they visited their hospital. They shook hands with their well-paid, perhaps overpaid doctor who had never had a patient, and then returned home. This couldn't go on, they thought, after 15, 16 years. And by simultaneous acts of the Doyle and the Northern Ireland Parliament in 1938, the Ballyratton Hospital was transferred to the Irish Free State. So you can imagine these are just the intricacies of partition. But for the people on the ground, whether they were in Drum or they were in Newton Gore and County Leitrim, or they were in, uh, well, they were just outside the northern area, or they were in um, uh, Carrigan's or Newton Cunningham and County Donegal, they could only hope in 1921 that the Boundary Commission might bring in the, the more densely populated Protestant areas. And actually, the Boundary Commission, which was suppressed, would actually have brought a, brought a rich part of East Donegal into the north. Uh, it would have brought the area around Newton Cunningham and given Derry a, a richer hinterland. Remember, Derry was the railway centre and economic centre for Donegal and North West Ireland. Um, I mean, partition was a catastrophe for, for, for Derry, no question about that. But the key thing was um, these people found themselves abandoned. And as Ronald McNeil, the historian of unionism, wrote, men felt betrayed and deserted, or shamed and dishonoured in the case. And the big houses of Ulster, the Tynans of Tynan Abbey, the Leslies of Glasslock, Churchill's first cousins, the um, West Tenras of Rossmore Castle, and all of those people, they felt very aggrieved because the gentry wanted to keep the nine counties people like Hugh Montgomery of Five Mile Town. These were big landlords. And they had a social circuit which transcended anything like partition. And they suddenly found Ulster divided. Okay, I, mean, I just want to make a couple of wee remark, echo a couple of remarks that people have posted. Um, we have one from an M in Nice. We talked about coming from a, a Protestant village, as it was described in uh, County Cabin some time ago, and just a bit of an experience in there. Without been bad blood, but people still were frightened in the left. Some some people left her, um, but had the idea that you maybe have a little track sometime about who do we think we are. An interesting concept. Another point there was from someone asking. I think it's from Ryan. He asked uh, if there had not been violence on both or either sides at the time, would partition still have actually happened, or would unification have been allowed to continue on? So it's interesting. If you look at unionist, um, Ulster Unionist Council records for County Fermanagh, for example, the county I know well, um, good relations between farmers who have been living cheek by jowl for 400 years in Fermanagh, a very strong non conformist conscience in Fermanagh. The Fermanagh Me Methodists and the Cooneyites, um, they had long been supporters of the Land League from the 1880s on. I mean, the Fermanagh Nationalist MP was Jeremiah Jordan, a Methodist shopkeeper and a deed lay preacher who only died, only died as MP in 1911. So you had people like that. And the Ulster Unionist agent in Fermanagh said that in 1912, the farmers were just getting on with their business. They weren't remotely interested in home rule. And he said, we'll have to rouse these people up. So certainly in parts of Ulster, what you would call Unionist Ulster, there probably wasn't a huge appetite. I mean, you read the papers of um, the Mulholland, um, uh, Lord um, Dunleith, um, the Mulholland family of North Don, who'd made their money in linen. Um, he writes to Carson in 1915, surely we're not serious about getting on with this fighting lark. This was just, if home rule comes about, we'll have to accept it. I mean, you know, there are rifts in the loot. I mean, looking back, it looks as though you have this solid phalanx. I mean, Carson was very worried about civil war in Ireland. And he was working behind the scene to try to find a compromise solution. And if Redmond had got his act together in 1914 in response to what had been a united country, um, I mean, certainly the unionists wouldn't have got the six counties because Bono Law wrote to Carson in 1913, well, we can't demand six counties because we don't have a vote. And certainly if partition had occurred under the Labour government of 1924 or under the, uh, the Labour majority of 1945, when democracy was more in vogue. I mean, for men at Tyrone, Derry, Newry, South Down, South Armagh would never have been included in Northern Ireland. And you would have had a heartland, a homeland, as Craig always envisaged, which would have had an 80% Protestant majority and would not be under democratic threat today. But the Ulster Unionists, of course, as one historian has written, have to be seen very much in the tradition of European nationalists at this time. Because, of course, like the Czechs, um, like the... Um, the, the Poles, they were demanding buffer zones that they weren't entitled to. 
buffer zones like South Fermanagh, like South Armagh, like West Tyrone. Like, you know, I mean, nobody voted unionist in these areas. Uh, that was Gaelic Ulster. And these areas were forced to come in. And of course, unionism brought a Trojan horse in. A much smaller Northern Ireland would have been much more viable. And Catholics would have been a preserved species. Okay, well, we're going to wrap up very, very quickly, but uh, could I ask maybe one final question? Um, and that be around the role of trade unionism, I suppose, because you referred earlier on to the NUDL, the National Union of Dock Labourers, um, but that then moved into the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, obviously, as well, at a later point. So well, what would the, the role of the trade union movement have been around that whole period? One of the problems, I think, um, Mr. Speaker, is that the trade unions, of course, uh, tended to reflect two different kinds of workers. You had the, the kind of... Um, if you like, aristocracy of labour, the kind of skilled workers in the shipyards and engineering were Belfast compared to Liverpool or Glasgow. You had this um, upper class of industrial workers. The people who in East Belfast, for example, lived in the two and a half storey houses as compared to the little kind of parlour houses where the, the labourers lived. And uh, they were much better paid and so on. And they're the people who campaigned for a 44-hour weekend. Uh, they're very much in sync with uh, industrial unrest in Glasgow. They're influenced by the Russian Revolution and so on. And then you have the more general unions that people like Larkin and Connolly were trying to create um, in the early 20th century for the uh, unskilled mill workers and so on. Um, you have that there. The problem was that um, in the north of Ireland, uh, sectarianism tended to trump um, non-sectarian um, trade unionism uh, throughout modern industrial history. You can see it in the 1886, Catholics were expelled from the shipyard during the Home Rule Crisis. 1912, there's a brief expulsion. And of course, what tends to happen is organised groups of workers, loyalist workers, um, tend to have the whip hand in a crisis. And they're the people who drive uh, Catholics out of their work in the summer of 1920, creating in the words of one Catholic businessman who met Churchill, a ghetto in the Catholic mind, because they're never reinstated. And that is a wrong that's never righted as we move into the, the, the slump years of the 1920s and the depressed years of the 1930s. And I mean, people remembered when I was growing up, people talked about the expelled workers, many of whom were ex-soldiers, and most of whom were constitutional nationalist supporters of Joe Devlin. They were called Sinn Feiners, but they weren't. And that affects the Lagan, the Ban, the Mill and Guildford, all of that. That's a huge thing there. Now, the trade unions don't react to that to any great extent. And uh, when it's raised at trade union meetings in Britain, um, nothing is really done about it. And the RIC in 1920 talk about, you know, 50,000 Catholics living in absolutely grinding poverty because of the expulsions. Eventually they get some sort of uh, sustenance from the state, thanks to Joe Devlin, but that's an issue there. So trade unionism is weak. And yet, you know, in Glasgow, for example, you have read Clyde's site during this, this period, where actually there's a lurch to the rest, to, to the left. And you've often heard, even down the years, um, Ulster unionists from a working class background uh, saying that if they were in England, they would vote Labour. You know, and one of the strange things is that unionist parties, uh, when they exercise influence in, in, in Britain, in British politics from the 1880s to the present day, they always support the Tory party. Yet, if you ask the ordinary unionist working man, oh, I would vote Labour in England, it's one of these dissonant things. And it suggests that, you know, say, sectarian divisions have not been addressed. There was an attempt to address them in the 1780s and 90s in Belfast's golden age when Presbyterians built the first Roman Catholic chapel and the priest said, it's a mark of regard which shall never be forgotten. But that evanesces as we go into the very divided sectarianized 19th century. And by the 20th century, unionists really believe, and there is evidence to support their view that home rule may be Rome rule, and nationalists really fear um, the domination of a unionist government in Belfast with control of policing and the electoral system. And uh, of course, uh, this is the problem in that documents like the Ulster Covenant um, influence nationalists. The Ulster Union has said that if a parliament was set up in Dublin to, uh, you know, um, uh, administer them, they would refuse to recognize its, its authority. Well, that's exactly what Joe Devlin and De Valera say in 1921. It's the same policy. <clears throat> Okay, Emily, thanks very, very much. And I think, folks, that unfortunately draws our event this evening to a close. But just remember, we have a further two lectures of this particular series. So the questions that are left uh, on, on us tonight can be dealt with again in the next couple of lectures. So there'll be plenty of opportunity to continue on the theme as uh, 
has been carried through this evening. Um, I want to thank Eamon, obviously, uh, very much for your excellent uh, presentation tonight again. I'd like to thank the MLAs who are in attendance tonight. And, of course, thank everybody there from the, the public from as far away as Connecticut, never mind Swan and Bar or Derry or wherever you come from. So, uh, again, I want to thank everybody who has participated because your participation which makes this series a success apart from the uh, wonderful lectures delivered by Dr. Eamon, McFe Eamon Phoenix. So on that note, can I thank Eamon and uh, thank everybody else for attending and thank the Sam Assembly staff for putting this uh, Zoom meeting together tonight. Okay, so we look forward Thanks, Alex. And thanks, Louise, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you, Knight. Good night. Bye-bye.